Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's webinar. It is 6.30 on the dot, and it's time for us to get started. My name is Richard Schroka. I do the marketing here at Rivkin, and I'm joined by our local investment analyst, Mr. William O'Loughlin. How are you, Will? Good, thanks, Richard. And I um, hope everyone's doing well who's in attendance tonight. Thank you for joining us. Before we do get started, I just must remind everyone that the contents of tonight's presentation will contain general advice only and not take into account your personal circumstances. So let's get into it. Tonight we're going to be talking about the ABCs of fundamental analysis. This is part one of a three-part series and basically Will's going to go over fundamental analysis, the stuff that makes up a lot of the Rivkin local products. So when, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here Will, but when you and Shannon sit down to assess an event trade or look at the in income strategy. This, these are the kind of things you look at, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, so Will's got a great presentation for you. He's got a really great pace and is really good at breaking down fundamental analysis. So I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items before we do dive into it and just let everyone know that the webinar will run for about an hour this evening, inclusive of questions. If you have a question, please type that into your question box as soon as it comes up, and Will would do his best to pick it up in stride. If not, he does leave some time at the end of the session to take any questions that do come up. We are recording this webinar, and we're going to get it out to you later on this week, um, so it won't be the day afterwards, but we will, rest assured, we'll get it out to you by the weekend, that recording of the webinar. And please, we will send a, a, um, a survey out at about an hour after the webinar. And if you could please take the time to fill out those six questions, we'd greatly appreciate it. It really helps shape the content of these presentations that we put on. And I'm just going to remind you one more time that everything we say in this webinar is general in nature only and is not taking into account your personal circumstances. But that is it for me. I'm going to hand it over to the man with the plan, Mr. William O'Loughlin. Over to you, Will. Okay. Thanks, Richard. All right, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Um, let's get started. So I just wanted to start with a slide basically giving an outline of the coming presentation. So I really want everyone to finish this webinar with an insight into some aspects of fundamental analysis. So we're going to look at some different investing styles, how to calculate some basic finance, financial ratios from a balance sheet, uh, and then we're going to look at performing what's called a stock screen, which is a method to narrow down a la large list of stocks to a much smaller list um, that uh, can then be candidates for investment. Uh, the next point, I want to make sure that um, any questions uh, that you guys have um, will be answered in regards to parts of the webinar that aren't clear. So as Richard said, please feel free to ask any questions. And then finally, at the end of the webinar, I'm going to give you a link um, to trial our service for three months for $99. Um, this is just for new, um, new, new people, um, not existing members. Um, so uh, look out for that link at the end of the webinar. Okay, so let's jump in. <clears throat> so first, we need to start with what is fundamental analysis. So there are two broad categories of investing strategy, fundamental and technical. Then within those two strategies, you can have either systematic or discretionary. So fundamental looks at the, the, the um, qualities of the business that, that you're investing in. So might be looking at the, the profits, the cash flow, um, you know, the assets, the liabilities, <clears throat> and looking at all of those things to try and come to a view about whether it is a, a good business or not. On the other hand, technical is looking at the price action um, of, of the stock um, and using historical uh, patterns to try and make um, decisions about what to do in the future. So then the, um, under, underneath those two headings, um, you can either have a systematic strategy um, which uses a defined set of rules to decide what to invest in. So with a systematic strategy, there would generally not be any human judgment involved. It, it's all based on the rules. And then discretionary is the opposite of that, is where it's uh, 
you know, some person is making a judgment about uh, what stocks to invest in and which ones to avoid. So Rivkin Local has four different strategies and I've just listed them here under which of these um, categories they, they fit in. Um, so we have the blue chips and the income as a fundamental systematic strategy. Um, the event strategy isn't as well, it doesn't fall that well into a category, but if I had to put it in one, I would say it's fundamental discretionary. And finally, we have the Rivkin Momentum strategy, which is a technical systematic strategy. So <clears throat> we do webinars on, on each of these um, individual um, strategies that we run, um, but I'm just mentioning them here to show where they all fit in this scheme. So as I mentioned before, fundamental analysis relates to a property of the business. So you've got to remember when you're buying shares in a company, you're li literally buying um, a part ownership in that company. Um, so you want to perform some fundamental analysis to find out how the business is doing. You know, uh, how are the profits going? Is it generating cash? Does it pay dividends? Um, you know, is it is it loaded with debt? These are all all the types of things that you want to look at when you're evaluating business. And that just contrasts with technical analysis, which is based on uh, changes in the share price and looking at the charts to um, determine um, what, what actions to take. In addition to looking at the business itself, a proper fundamental analysis will also look at the wider environment. So you want to look at economic factors, business environment, the regulatory environment, um, competition, um, and then obviously the business. So as an example, um, Donald Trump was recently um, elected in the US. Um, so that would fall under a, you know, the regulatory environment. So he's potentially going to change many of the regulations um, in the US. So if you were evaluating a US-based company, you would certainly want to be looking at what kind of regulations um, Trump might implement um, and incorporate that into your analysis of the, of the specific company. The next important thing to cover is the difference between investing and speculation. And I, I really want to emphasize this um, because I think unfortunately uh, many um, retail investors who don't have a lot of experience um, in, in investing um, can end up more or less uh, just speculating. So just, just hope, buying something on the hope that the price will go up um, and not really having a, any kind of system or strategy. So in the previous slides I was talking about um, a the systematic versus discretionary. So even a discretionary strategy should have some kind of a system behind it. Um, so you know, all, all of the good fund managers, even if they have a discretionary strategy, will still have um, some kind of system in place for deciding which stocks to buy. So you need to make sure that you avoid um, just speculating on the stock market, which is simply buying and hoping. Um, the, the most important part of investing for me is developing a plan and then sticking to it. Um, obviously, if, if you've been following a plan for a while and it's not working, you can go back, reevaluate the plan, um, make some changes and then, and then try again and see how it goes. Um, but you certainly don't want to just wing it, let's say, and, um, and just go completely off the, off the plan. So when we develop a plan, we want to make sure that the plan helps us to decide when to buy, obviously, um, but also planning when to sell is extremely important, probably more important than the buy decision. Um, it's, in my opinion, it's much easier to buy a stock um, than it is to sell. Um, and, and we'll sort of cover that more in later slides. <clears throat> 
Okay, so in terms of developing a plan, um, these are two broad categories um, of, of sort of a system for deciding what stocks to buy. One of them is called the top-down approach and the other one is called the bottom-up approach. So the names give a little bit of a clue as to what they are. Top-down means you're starting with the broad economic picture. So you, you might look at the, you know, the global economic situation um, and you might decide that, that resources in Australia is, is a sector that you like. Right? So then once you've chosen a, an industry that you like, you then do some analysis on that industry to look at the supply and demand characteristics. Um, you know, are the, is the regulatory environment favourable for that industry? Um, and, yeah, and, and what is the outlook for that industry going forward? How, how do things look um, from a forecast point of view? And then you drill down even further and you try and find the, the good stocks within that industry. And then those are the ones that you consider buying. So you've started with a very, very broad view and then narrowed it down. On the other hand, you can have the bottom-up style of investing, um, which is just basically starting with the entire list of stocks, choosing some kind of criteria to filter it by, um, so you might look at the dividend yield, for example, um, and filter down the stocks based on their dividend yield uh, and, and narrow it down that way. And once you get to a small enough list, then you choose which specific stocks um, you go ahead and invest in. Um, so that's the, the bottom-up approach. Um, and the stock screen is something that we're going to look at uh, later on in this webinar. So, what are, what are some of the steps um, involved in fundamental analysis? So, from the business point of view, I've just listed a, a few key questions that you would want to ask yourself um, before investing in a, in a company. Um, obviously, this list isn't extensive, isn't um, comprehensive, I should say, um, because, yeah, to do, a, to do a really thorough analysis, there's there are a large number of things that you want to look at, um, but these are probably some of the more important ones. One of the first things to ask is, do you understand the business? Um, this is one of um, Warren Buffett's key mantras, is that he won't invest in a business that he doesn't understand. Um, so this kind of varies from person to person. Some people have you know, knowledge of one particular industry, um, while, while others don't. So it's sort of a good idea to stick to the areas that you know something about um, or at least stick to the areas where, where you understand how the company is making money. Um, if you don't understand how they're making money, then you, you can't really possibly understand the business. Um, the next thing is to look at the financial reports. Um, this is a little bit trickier um, for people who don't have training in, in accounting um, and reading financial reports. Um, but generally, you want to make sure that they're, f they're reporting um, following the appropriate standards. Um, so IFRS is the um, International Financial Reporting Standards, um, and GAAP is the, I think, generally accepted accounting principles, I think. Um, so uh, that's that, that's really important because if they're issuing, if they're issuing yeah, low quality financial reports, then it's very hard to get a good understanding of the of the company's performance. Um, next, you want to look at the company earnings. So earnings can be used interchangeably with profits. Um, so often, it's a good idea to, if you're looking at a specific company, um, just just look at their earnings over the past five years. Or you, you can go back further, but let's say at least five years. Um, and then you can get a bit of an idea how the earnings have been changing over time. Obviously, if the earnings are trending down, then you want to be asking the question, well, what, what's going on? Why are they trending down? Um, 
yeah, if they're trending up, then that's obviously a, a better sign. Um, but even if they are trending it up, up, it's still a good idea to try and understand why they are trending up. Uh, the next important thing is actually the cash flow. Um, cash flow differs uh, from earnings. It's a little bit complicated to understand, but the simple explanation is that um, companies will depreciate their, their assets. So if we took a mining com company as an example, um, and they bought a, you know, a digger as part of the mining operation and they pay $100,000 for it, they don't, they don't deduct $100,000 from their profits in the year that they bought it. They deduct some percentage of that um, every year for a few years. So they might deduct $20,000 um, of the purchase price of that digger from their profits each year for the next five years, um, and that's, that's depreciation. Um, and because of depreciation, the uh, cash flow from the company can differ from the earnings. So it's important that a company has um, good cash flow as well as good profits. Um, obviously, yeah, the company needs cash to pay suppliers, um, pay staff, um, and just you know, generally function. Um, next, um, it's good to look for unusual or extraordinary items uh, in, the, in the financial reports, in, in their earnings. Um, so often a company might have some large expense, but they consider it to be a one-off one expense. And so they will report that as an unusual or extraordinary item. Now normally that's fine, it is a one-off expense, so you can kind of um, not, not count it when you're looking at the profits uh, on the assumption that it won't recur the next year. Um, but there are some companies that tend to have these items coming up year after year, um, and that certainly raises some, some flags. Um, finally, you might look at the dividend yield. Um, so the dividend yield is simply the amount of the dividends paid divided by the share price. Um, but we will look at that um, in a later slide. So the dividends obviously represent the company earnings that are paid back to shareholders. Um, so <clears throat> for investors who want to receive that um, steady income, um, it's a good idea to search for stocks that have a high dividend yield. Okay, next, as I mentioned earlier, in, you don't want to just look at the specific company. It's also good to take a look at the broader sector and, and the economy as a whole. So you might look at where in the, in the business cycle um, we are, you know, we, the boom phase or in, into a recession um, and, and use that to judge the prospects of various companies. Um, so cyclical companies will be very affected by the business cycle, whereas um, sort of blue chip, stronger companies um, will have more stable earnings over time. Um, then you look at looking at the economic prospects of the sector. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, so if we were looking at the resources sector, you would be looking at um, where the forecasts are for commodity prices. You know, our commodity prices forecast to rise, um, which would therefore be good for resources companies um, or otherwise. Uh, if you were looking at um, banks, uh, then you might be looking at the interest rate. So banks will generally have better margins when the interest rate is high. Um, so that, that would be something that you would certainly take into account if you were evaluating banks. Um, next, the regulatory environment, which I already mentioned. Um, so often that's a case of looking at the government in power, looking at what policies they um, are talking about implementing, what policies they've recently implemented, um, and then trying to judge how that will affect uh, the, the given company. Um, next, obviously, you want to look at the major competitors. Um, is it 
you know, are there are there very few competitors um, with high, you know, with high barriers to entry, or are there a lot of competitors? And then I've already mentioned that last one, um, the barriers to entry. So, an industry with high barriers to entry means that it's very difficult to start a new company in that industry. So let's take a um, liquefied natural gas company as an example. Um, they have high barriers to entry because building the LNG plant sorry, is extremely expensive. So it means it's very hard for a new startup company to come in and build an LNG plant. Um, so that, that acts as a barrier to entry for, um, for that um, sector. Um, and those high barriers to entry can be beneficial for companies that are already established. On the other hand, there might be very low barriers to entry. Um, so, you know, starting a, starting a new um, corner store isn't, isn't particularly difficult. So that, that sector would be considered to have low barriers to entry. Okay, so now we get really into the meat of um, fundamental analysis and we're going to take a look at some financial ratios. Now there are a large number of different ratios that you can um, look at with companies and I can't possibly cover them all um, in this time. Um, but I've chosen some of the more well-known um, and pr probably more important ones um, and I'm going to show how to calculate these. And the good thing is once I've shown you how to do a few of them, it shouldn't be too hard to then go and research and, and find out how to calculate some of the other ones. So the good thing about these ratios is that they're dimensionless. So this basically means that we can use them to compare big companies with small companies and, and, and still have a fair comparison. Um, so obviously something like revenue you can't compare, you can't directly compare the revenue of, you know, Telstra with the revenue of, of some other, you know, tiny company. Um, obviously Telstra's revenue is going to be um, much higher. Um, so we use these ratios to put two companies on a level playing field. And that should become more, um, that will become easier to understand once I, once I move on to the next slides. So there are five categories of financial ratio, um, activity, liquidity, profitability, solvency and valuation. So activity is looking at the day-to-day -day efficiency of the company's operations. You know, how efficiently are they um, selling their inventory? Um, liquidity looks at the company's ability to meet their short-term obliga obligations. <clears throat> So this is sort of related to the cash flow. Essentially, do they are they generating enough cash to pay their um, pay interest on their debts, um, to pay suppliers, um, that kind of thing. Uh, next, there's profitability. Um, so, I mean, that is as it sounds. Um, just looking at, at how profitable the company is. Um, for example, you might look at the net profit margin, um, which is something that we're going to look at. Um, next, there's solvency. So this is about meeting long-term obligations. Um, so is the company generating enough profit to um, pay back its, you know, its debt, its longer-term debt as it comes due? And finally, uh, the valuation ratios, <coughs> which look at the performance on a per share basis. So for example, price to earnings. Um, which is something we're going to look at in more detail. So I've chosen these three categories, profitability, solvency and valuation, um, to go into more detail. So I'm using Telstra here uh, as an example to show you how to calculate uh, some of these uh, ratios. Um, that's not to say we do or don't uh, recommend Telstra, uh, it's just uh, I'm just using it as an example. So I pulled this from the Telstra half year report. It's not right at the top of the report. You have to, you have to scroll down a little bit uh, to get to it. Um, 
but once you find it, it, it gives you the, um, the performance of the company. So it's giving you their revenue, expenses, um, and profit. Now, from this information, we want to calculate the operating profit margin. So this measures how efficiently they turn revenues into profits. And it's a very simple calculation. We just need to take earnings before interest and taxes, which is often abbreviated as EBIT, and then divide it by revenue. So where do we find these numbers? So revenue is the first uh, line item here, um, which is um, 13.6 billion. So these figures are in millions, I should uh, mention. And then lower down, we have the earnings before interest and, and income tax, the EBIT, which in this case is 3.3 billion. So we simply take this lower figure and divide it by the revenue. And we get, sorry, I'm, I'll just go back a slide there. Uh, we divide uh, this number by this number to get the um, operating profit margin. So I haven't shown the result of this calculation here, um, but on this next page what I've done is performed this calculation for three um, similar companies. So Telstra, Focus and TPG are, are all um, telecom companies. So I'm, I'm trying to use this uh, example here to, ex to show how you can compare three different sized companies. So you can see that Telstra's revenue of um, 24 billion um, is much larger than Vocus's of 830 million. So there's a huge difference in the size of the company here, but we can use this ratio operating profit margin to compare them on a fair basis. So you, in case anyone's wondering, um, this 13 billion on the previous side, slide was from the half year report. So this is just six months worth of revenue. Um, that's why this figure here, which is from the full year report, um, is much larger because uh, it counts for a full year's worth of results. Right, so for each of these companies, I've listed the revenue on the first row, then the um, operating profit, which is the, that EBIT figure that we had. Um, and then I've divided the um, operating profit by the revenue to get this operating profit margin. So we can see that 25.6% for Telstra and 25% for TPG are very similar. So you would say that in this metric, um, both of these companies are um, on, a, you know, on a similar basis. They're, they're doing equally well. Um, Vocus, on the other hand, has a... Has a profit margin of just 14%. So it's significantly lower than the other two. Now, if you looked deeper into this, um, you would find that because Vocus is a smaller company, um, it, it, has, it, it doesn't have such good economies of scale um, that these larger companies have. Um, so it ends up having larger expenses relative to its revenue, um, and therefore it ends up with a lower um, operating profit margin. So it's worth mentioning that obviously a higher margin is more efficient revenue conversion. So what, one way to look at this is to say that 25% of TPG's revenue is turned into profits, whereas only 14% of Vocus's revenue is turned into profits. So Vocus needs to generate more revenue than TPG to achieve a given level of profits. So in short, um, higher is better for, for this measure. So in this case, if we were evaluating these companies, we might um, dig a little deeper into Vocus to find out what's going on, um, why is that profit margin lower than the other two, and we might go back and calculate it for previous years um, to see how it's been changing over time. Has it been increasing? Has it been decreasing? Um, these are these are some of the things that we want to look at. Okay, so next we're going to look at a solvency ratio. So this looks at um, the ability of the company to cover its long-term debts. So one such ratio is the debt to assets ratio, 
and it's simply the total debt divided by the total assets. So this um, excerpt is also from the half-year report of Telstra um, for the half-year ended 31st of December 2015. Um, it's obviously a little bit out of date now, so you'd, you'd want to probably dig up more current um, reports if you were looking for the current figure. But basically we just find the balance sheet, so um, the area where these figures are provided is called the balance sheet. Uh, and then under that we find the assets section and then at the bottom we look for total assets. Um, so in this case it's 42.4 billion. Then underneath that you'll see the section for liabilities um, and at the bottom of that you'll see um, borrowings in the current liabilities section and borrowings in the non-current liabilities section and then we just add those two figures together to get the total debt. So total interest bearing debt, 17.4 billion. Then finally to calculate the debt to assets we just divide the debt by the assets and we find uh, that for Telstra it's 0.41. So this obviously measures how big uh, a company's debt burden is. Um, a bigger number here means the burden is greater. Now with this ratio there's no hard and fast rule about what, what is a good number and, and what isn't. Um, some companies use no debt and so their debt to assets would be zero. Um, some co companies use a lot of debt. So it's a good idea uh, if, if you're looking at this ratio to compare it with other companies in the same industry. Um, and then you can make a relative valuation saying, well, yeah, this, this company is using a lot more debt than this other company. Um, but as a general rule, anything above um, 0 0.6 is getting, getting towards the high end. Okay, finally, we look at uh, some valuation ratios, like the price to earnings ratio. This is probably one that people um, have most likely heard of. Um, and it's simply the current share price divided by the earnings per share. So the current share price is relatively easy to, ex um, to obtain, um, either from the ASX website or um, from your stockbroking platform. Um, earnings per share is also obtained from the financial statements. Uh, and you dig around and you'll find um, earnings per share um, just using the, the basic figure here is fine uh, and we have 17.2 cents. So I looked up the Telstra share price um, recently, it was $5.14 divided by the 17.2 cents. Although again this is from the half year report and therefore these earnings are just for half a year. So we want to multiply this figure by 2 to make it an annual figure. So I've multiplied 17.2 by 2 and that gives us a PE ratio of about 15. So the PE ratio um, measures how cheap or expensive the company is relative to earnings. So a lower figure means it's cheaper, higher figure more expensive. Um, now there's no sort of normal value of PE, um, it can can have a fairly high range. Um, certain companies have very high PE ratios. Um, Domino's Pizza, for example, trades on a very high price to earnings ratio, um, whereas other, other companies might normally trade on a, on a much lower ratio. So again, as with all of these ratios, it's good to calculate them for a few different companies in the same industry, um, and then you can look at where one company sits relative to another company. So um, yeah, companies with, with high expected earning growth, uh, growth will usually trade on a, on a high PE. So that's the reason Domino's is trading on such a high PE, um, is that the market expects its earnings to grow um, quite rapidly in the future. Um, on the other hand, a company with high capital expenditure requirements like miners um, would generally trade on a much lower PE 
um, because they have to reinvest a lot of their earnings back into the company. Um, some other valuation ratios that you can look at um, are price to cash flow, price to sales, price to book, price to book value, um, cash flow per share. Um, so yeah, as I said earlier, it's um, sort of difficult to cover all of the possible ratios, um, but you, if you do some you know digging around on Google, it's it's quite easy to find um, find out more about some of the other ones. But the yeah the basic principle of looking up financial reports, finding the relevant value, um, and then using that to calculate the ratio applies to pretty much all of these all of these ratios. So the next thing that we can do is called a stock screen. So I mentioned this in one of the early slides. Um, and there have been quite a few studies on this using a using certain financial reporting items um, to help explain market returns. Um, for example, there's a paper written by um, Pio Trosky um, called Value Investing, the Use of Historical Financial Statement Information to Separate Winners from Losers. Um, and I've just provided the, um, the reference there. Um, he does an investigation looking at high book to market ratio companies. Um, he applies various other filters um, and ends up finding that applying um, certain filters can earn you uh, excess returns in the market. So the, the, of the nine uh, measures that he, that he used, four of them were profitability, three were solvency and two of them were activity. Um, and then using those nine measures, he did some back testing uh, to show that uh, he could outperform the market um, over this period from 1976 to 1996. Um, he also found that the screen was more, um, more effective for small capitalization comp uh, companies. Um, that is to say, it earned higher returns or higher excess returns for the smaller companies. Okay, so his stock screen was actually quite complicated, um, as you might imagine, uh, but it doesn't need to be so complicated. Um, you can come up with um, a screen using some of the some of the financial ratios that, that we've already looked at. Um, so for example, you might, you start by selecting the search uh, universe as it is. So you might want to only look at stocks that are in the ASX 300. So obviously that'll be approximately 300 stocks. I don't think it's precisely 300 all the time. Um, and then you apply your filters to this one by one. So we start with all of these stocks and then we come up with the criteria. So let's say we only want to look at stocks that have a price to earnings ratio of less than 10. Um, so remember when we were looking at PE, a lower number was relatively cheaper, higher relatively more expensive. So having a PE less than 10 is kind of filtering out the more expensive stocks. So out of the 300 stocks that we started with, um, there might have been 50 that satisfied that criteria. So we've already narrowed down our, um, our universe of stocks significantly. Um, next, you might look at the price to book ratio. Okay, we didn't cover that in this, um, in this webinar here, um, but that's another co common financial ratio that can be quite easily calculated from the financial statements. So a lower price to book ratio means the company is relatively cheap, um, relatively cheap yeah, compared to um, other companies. So looking at a price to book ratio of less than 1.2 is again trying to filter out those relatively more expensive companies. So there might only be 38 of these ones that satisfy that criteria. Finally, you might look at the dividend yield Again, I didn't show the calculation, um, but the dividend yield is simply the 
um, dividends paid over the previous 12 months divided by the share price. So that also narrows down our search. Now, if we take all of these three criteria together, meaning that for a stock to pass our screen, it has to pass all three of these criterion, now we may have narrowed down our starting list of 300 to just five. And then from those five, you can go ahead and perform the, um, the, the detailed fundamental analysis to decide which of those five that you want to buy. So basically we're using this stock screen to uh, narrow down the, um, the, the selection of stocks that you, that you might invest in. So I know some um, broking platforms provide a built-in stock screen that you can use. Um, in part two, uh, yeah, part two of this series, um, I show the uh, Rifkin stock broking platform and I show the stock screen and how to use it. Um, so you can basically just go onto that platform, put these uh, criteria in, um, you know, hit go, and then it'll it'll run that scan on the current list of ASX stocks and show you the show you the companies that satisfy um, those criteria. Okay, the final um, final thing I just wanted to mention um, without really going into detail is that um, financial analysts will often build models to try and value companies. Um, they can they can be quite complicated. Some of them aren't so complicated, um, but it's probably a, a bit past the, you know, this, this webinar, given that it's um, ABCs of Fundamental Analysis Part 1. Um, but basically, most models really rely on estimates or forecasts, and that's where the uncertainty comes in. So even if a model spits out a target price, um, you'll often see that if you're reading a, a research report on a company, it might have a target price of you know, twenty dollars and twenty-five cents, and and you might sort of wonder, well, you know, where, how do they come up with exactly twenty dollars and twenty-five cents? Um, that will have come from one of these models, most likely. Um, but you shouldn't be fooled by the the specificity of that of that number, um, because the model will have relied on estimates or forecasts. So there there will be a margin of error uh, in that forecast. Okay, so um, having talked about that, I just wanted to mention um, some of the strategies that Rivkin employs. Um, in particular, the two strategies that do use a stock screen. Um, so the blue chip strategy um, looks for the highest dividend yielding stocks um, in the ASX 50. So uh, investors in this um, portfolio are normally looking for steady um, income. Um, so obviously stocks that are high dividend yielding are paying uh, regular dividends um, and, and therefore you expect to get some, some dividend income from that portfolio. Um, having said that, it should be noted that obviously the dividend yield is based on historical dividends and you can't guarantee that the company will continue to pay those dividends. That's always a risk. Um, but uh, ne nevertheless, you, you, you do expect to receive um, some dividend income from that strategy. Um, the next one that uses a screen is the income strategy. Um, in this case, we're looking at hybrid securities. Um, if you don't know what they are, don't worry too much. They're basically a combination between debt and equity. Um, if you want to find out more about those, you can certainly contact us um, and, and we can explain. Um, but essentially this strategy is also um, designed to provide a high income yield. Um, so these hybrid securities also pay a effectively a dividend um, and therefore you're receiving that regular income. The, um, this strategy is also considered uh, lower risk um, than, than equities. So hybrid securities fit in between um, debt and equity. Uh, 
uh, and therefore this portfolio can give you lower risk than a, an equity portfolio. So the other two strategies we have are Momentum, which is a systematic technical one. We do a separate webinar on that. Um, and the event strategy, which is more like a fundamental discretionary uh, strategy, which we also do, do a webinar on. Um, but the blue chip and the, and the income ones utilize that stock screen um, like we've covered uh, in this webinar. And so here I, I just want to mention that people that are new to Rivkin can try these strategies um, using our um, special introductory offer. Um, which is just $99 for a three-month membership. So as a summary, um, we looked at how fundamental investing can be either systematic or discretionary. We looked at the top-down and bottom-up um, systems for choosing stocks. Uh, we looked at some financial ratios um, for performing some fundamental analysis. Um, and then we looked at how to calculate some of those ratios from the financial statements. <clears throat> Finally, we looked at that stock screen and we mentioned some of the models that, um, that are probably a more advanced topic. Right, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, I said I'd give uh, new members a link here um, to try that $99 offer. Um, so that's simply www.rivkin.com.au forward slash FA99. Um, <coughs> FA coming from fundamental analysis. And $99 is the, is the cost of that three-month trial. Uh, I've also put my contact details. Uh, if anyone wants to email me to ask questions or, or just have a chat, um, you can use that email address there um, or, or use this phone number here. Uh, that I've given. So I didn't receive any questions uh, yet, but if any anyone has any questions, then now now is a good time to ask. No, no one has any questions. I'll just give it another another minute in case uh, anyone's typing. Okay, so um, yeah, Catherine just asked um, if we could please send a link to the recording. Um, yeah, the, re the recording uh, will be available um, after the webinar. It will be emailed to all our registrants. Are there any, any other questions from anyone else? Okay, it uh, doesn't look like there are any more questions coming in, but I've provided my email address there, so uh, anyone can feel free to just uh, send me an email if they, if they um, have any further questions. So, yeah, thanks everyone for joining this webinar, and um, yeah, keep an eye out for um, other webinars that we do. Um, I think James is actually doing one tomorrow evening at 6.30. It's part two of his technical analysis. So if you want to get a comprehensive skill set of analysis on stocks, be sure to join us tomorrow at 6.30. That email will be going out tonight and you can register in the link provided. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining and hope to see you, or see you in our webinars again soon. Have a great night.